it's David, and you're listening to the Tone Bass Classical Guitar Podcast. Are you still not a member of Tone Bass? Well, head on over to ToneBase.co and use the promo code PODCAST-3 to unlock hundreds of fantastic lessons. I've got Matt Greif on the show today. He is a member of the Los Angeles Guitar Quartet and a great solo performer as well. We had a great conversation back in Los Angeles on how he auditioned uh, for LHEQ and was accepted into the ensemble, along with some really exciting projects uh, the quartet has recently had, including uh, commissions from uh, none other than Pat Bethany, along with uh, the great impressionistic composer you hear us talk about, Alan Wilcox. Also talked about uh, some of his solo projects, both classical and jazz. And I've got a sample from a soon-to-be digitally released album, this is a wonderful piece by Milano. This is Fantasia number 30. solo uh, record. Was this kind of your debut recording that then? Was, yeah, my first solo recording. Yep. And tell me about the program on that. You got a, you got really, a premiere I'm at Bogdanovich? St- yeah, I still really love that program. Um, there's a lot of variety on there. It's kind of a jazz, or rather classical meets world and jazz music fusion. Um, so there's a, there's a premiere of a Bogdanovich piece uh, and it's kind of at the time, the Gypsy Kings, a nouveau flamenco group, were kind of big, and that was kind of in the air. And I was, I was, you know, playing a lot of nylon string, but improvising. So I said, you know, uh, Dujon, you know, it'd be great to have something kind of in that realm, but you know, whatever you feel is right for you. I, I want you to be you, but that might be one getting, you know, idea to to one one path to go down. And so he came up with this brilliant idea of taking a Narvaez uh, set of diferencias, which are variations, and writing his own variations on that set of variations. So he calls it diferencias diferentes. Oh, okay. And so it's based on this Narvaez progression. Uh, there's little s- snippets of melody, but it's, it's really the progression he takes and then um, does his own world fusion thing with it. And there's a little spot in the middle where he leaves open so you can take a, a, an improvised solo or work something out if you want. So I did that. 
So uh, that's a pretty cool piece. And then I did uh, an Indian influence piece of his um, introduction and Paschaya for the Golden Flower, I believe is what it's called. Mm. And then uh, I did a solo version of a Miles Davis tune, Blue and Green, which goes through a few stylistic variations. And then probably the most unique thing on the CD are a set of uh, spontaneous improvisations I did with Dujan. And uh, those are, they really range in mood from completely out there, whack, wacko, you know, stream of consciousness to more like little melodic ballad. One, one is kind of a melodic ballad, a very tonal kind of thing. So, you know, they're, they're, there's a stylistic uh, range right, right there in that little set. Were you a student? Of Bogdanovich's when he was teaching here at USC? You know, he, he taught, he filled in for Jim Smith when Jim was on sabbatical for, I think it was just one semester. So I did study with okay. him that semester. Um, was that when you started to collaborate and work with him then? Yeah, so I started, oh, I do kind of remember now. Uh, yeah, that semester he taught Jim's uh, performance class and he had everybody improvise a little bit. And um, that was kind of a key moment for me because I had played uh, jazz growing up, but I had gotten away from it. And so that, and there was an Afro, Afro-Latin percussion class I took here. And those two things kind of made me start thinking about improv- improvising again. A year or two later, when he was in San Francisco uh, teaching, and I, I visited a few times, and I remember going to his place, and that's really where we... We played quite a few times and you know, improvised and, and uh, yeah, so, so just became friends and, and occasional musical collaborators, you know. And so did you start as a jazz guitarist then or did you start with classical and No, when I, when, I, when I was in school uh, at first, uh, in, meaning my bachelor's and master's degrees, I was 100% classical guitarist. I, I was, you know, all in. And it was only when I graduated that I, well, at the end of my master's degree is what I was just, just describing. That's when I kind of started missing the creative side of, of music, you know, improvising. Were you a jazz guitarist before college, though? Yes. So, so in junior high and high school, I was playing jazz. Okay. And yeah, so I kind of left it when I went to college. And then I got very, I really missed the improvisation and the, the writing, too. I'm not a great composer or anything but i do write jazz tunes and you know that outlet is very important to me so i missed that and uh that my 20s were really all about kind of rediscovering improvisation getting a lot deeper into it than i ever had was that the first style of guitar you performed or learned not really i I grew up i grew up in this (laughs) kind of crazy musical household it was like a musical band literally (laughs) <laughs> and uh, so there were instruments that we would all just pick up, you know. Oh, okay. and, and so I knew the basics basics of guitar from a pretty young age. So I could play bluegrass stuff, or I could fake rock tunes, or whatever. And um, you know, it was all those you know bluegrass and country and rock, all these different sides. Classical too. Growing up, I played classical violin. So there was all this oh, really? going on. Wow. And uh, you know, I'd say rock guitar. And jazz fusion. Those are the two things that first really got me practicing and stuff. It got me excited. But then in my teens, I kind of got into classical guitar more, and I I enjoyed the structure of that. I felt like I was growing faster with that than anything else. And, and of course, the classical music itself um, meant a lot to me because, you know, I I think growing up playing violin, et cetera, kind of, plants those seeds so it was kind of cool it all came full circle a couple of times for me oh that's awesome and did you guys have a family band we we did (laughs) yeah yeah what was the name was there a name for it or was it just the gray family band no well actually this was more both sides of my family are, are musical uh but this family band stuff was really happening on my mom's side of the family and they're the hoppers so it was the hoppers (laughs) and uh yeah it was I, I have a couple of funny stories. I, I, I mean, like when I would play, I used to play drums, you know, and I used to play in a rock band a little bit, but not too often with the family band. Well, uh, my granddad who played guitar, kind of honky-tonk guitar, and my aunt who sang and played bass had a little band with a local drummer. Well, one night uh, 
their drummer called them like three hours before the gig and said he couldn't make it. So they turned to me literally in the kitchen and said, you're playing the gig tonight. <laughs> and I was like, what? Are you kidding me? And I was like 13. Wow. And no, no joke, my, my grandmother, she was just being silly, I'm sure, but she took like a little mascara brush and painted my peach fuzz black <laughs> so that, you know, if the cops walked in, they wouldn't take, take me out of there because I was underage, you know, at the it bar. Was at a bar. <laughs> it, was, it was just... So oh, that's there, great. There were a lot of weird, you know, funny, funny stories like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so funny. I, I, I never had the opportunity to play with my family. I mean, my mom was a violinist a bit. We played some duos, but we never had a family band. But yeah. that, that sounds like a blast. <laughs> so you went from that to kind of discovering the classical guitar and then rediscovering jazz. And it, it, that's what I find so unique about you as a player. You've got... Uh, you're a fantastic classical guitarist with great yeah. chops, and you're Thanks. a fantastic jazz guitarist as well with great chops. And then your most recent CD, this other one I'm holding on to called uh, Circle, this is an all jazz record of all your compositions? Right. Or well, not no, all of but just your compositions on the CD. Yeah, no, there's there's three or four uh, covers on there. Like there's a sting tune, actually. Oh, the message in a bottle. Message in a oh, bottle. Okay. And there's there's two or three jazz standards or like post bop type standards. Like there's Footprints by Wayne Shorter, for instance, and a, f a few of mine. Yeah, that's actually not that new a CD, right? It's like 14 years old. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but newer than the other one, though. But yeah, it's certainly you know it documents a little period uh, where I was playing a lot of jazz fusion, pretty yeah, pretty intensely. I mean. And it's often. a trio, you on guitar, and then mm -hmm. you have the bassist from Chick Corea's band. He, he played for a while with yeah. Chick Corea, uh, really, and a lot of other people. He's an amazing bass player, Rick Fiorbracci. Yeah. How did you meet him? That, that must have been I a blast I met him to play because him. when I was in my 20s and I was really kind of, like I said, exploring jazz, I was playing a lot um, professionally up in Santa Barbara where I lived. And uh, I met him uh, on a gig that we were both hired for. It was like a jazz big band gig. And he was just a monster bass player and could read and, you know, had chops and the whole deal. And it's not always easy to find somebody that's that competent. And also he was just really a good guy and, you know, very enthusiastic about certain things I was enthusiastic about, same kind of music we had in common. So anyway, after that, I, I played, you know, lots and lots of gigs up there, just my own trios or whatever in jazz clubs. And I hired him I, a lot, you know, so we ended up playing yeah. all the time. And oh, that's so cool. So I just thought he'd be great for that CD. Yeah. So when are you getting Chick Corea on the next CD? No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, that's that would be a good idea. Good yeah. idea. <laughs> so I guess it was after these CDs came out uh, that you joined the quartet. And right. What, what year was that? 2006. 2006. The predecessor in the seat you yeah. were sitting in was Andy York, you yeah. know, and being uh, very fluent in jazz as right. well. So. Right. Yeah. I, I think, you know, when the court, when Andy announced he was going to leave, they were looking for somebody that had a similar skill set, somebody that could play non classical music, somebody that could improvise when needed and uh, interested in different styles of music. And so, you know, they invited a certain, I don't know how many people they invited, maybe 12 people or whatever to audition. And I, uh, so yeah, I, I was just, that was just kind of me. You know, I was doing both jazz and classical. I was playing actually in the Faya Trio at that time. So I was back into classical guitar really heavily as mm -hmm. well as keeping up my jazz stuff. So um, yeah, I was just on the, the list, and then I worked my butt off on the audition. <laughs> I really wanted that gig. Man. Yeah. Oh, I really well, wanted it. paid off, for sure. Well, what what I'm, was I'm, I'm the not... audition process like for that? Was it just a rehearsal with new repertoire, basically? What they would do is they would, there were two or three rounds, and I think the first couple of rounds, they would send all of us um, auditioners or auditionees um, the music a week ahead of time or so, and then, yeah, we'd have a little rehearsal with them. Yeah. Um, and then the, at the very end, it, it was over quite a long period of time, like three months. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so at the very end, when they had whittled it down, um, there was a solo audition. And um, Really? Yeah. Wow. And, and yeah. And so uh, 
that was it, you know. It was such a quick story, but at the time, it like yeah. went on forever, you know. It was like uh, so. It was three months. Yeah. From the, it, for two, how, how many two, how two, many times did you rehearse with them before I the think, solo aspect? Of I the think audition? it was two. I could be wrong, but I think it was two rounds, and I think they then went off to Europe on tour where they were auditioning other people, oh, and really? I think wow. that's why there was the long yeah. wait. You know, it was I think all of us that had auditioned at first were just like. What's going on? I what just want it? to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But. Do you remember what you played in the solo round? Yeah, I played uh, part of PFA. Okay, Yeah. cool. Yeah. And yeah. since then, you've recorded how many CDs now with the quartet? Three, four? I, I think it's, it's probably hard three. to keep track. No, it's not that <laughs> many. <laughs> but I, I think it's three. There's the Brazil record, and then we did the concerto record called Interchange, and then New Renaissance yeah. a few years ago. Yeah. And... You guys have just recently recorded a couple new, really phenomenal suites that you guys commissioned. The Pat Metheny Road to the Sun. Right. And the Tillman Hopstock slash Alan Wilcox. Suite. Right. Yeah. Well, tell me, how did the, how did the Pat Metheny uh, start? How did that whole project come about? That must have been exciting for you, especially as a jazz guitarist. Yeah. Oh, he was absolutely on my top three, you know, guitarists, musicians, influences of all time. He yeah. was a huge hero of mine, is a huge hero of mine. And, uh, but, you know, it was really Scott that made the contact. Uh, Scott played on the same festival as Pat did in uh, Montana. Is that the, the crown of the guitar? The crown of the continent, I or think they that, call Okay, it. gotcha. That's right. And uh, Scott played a solo concert and Pat attended. And uh, Pat was apparently knocked out and, and uh, just congratulated Scott, saw him the next day or something, and um, they got to talking. And yeah. I think Scott jokingly said, well, hey, would you ever consider writing something for a guitar quartet or something like that? And uh, I think they both just kind of chuckled, but uh, Scott kept in touch with him and... Um, I think what was going to happen is a couple years later, the quartet was going to be playing the same festival again mm -hmm. as Pat. And so we had made some contacts just exploring, hey, could this really happen? This would be great. We're going to be in Montana. Maybe we could just talk about it or whatever. So he came to our concert and listened really carefully. You could tell he was walking around and he came up to us at intermission or maybe it was just after the concert. But, you know, he had obviously really drunk in everything that he had heard, you know. And uh, he was into it. He just said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. I want to make this happen." And wow. so we were all just pinching ourselves. You know, it's like, "Oh, this is just too amazing." And um, so that was uh, the beginning. And uh, then it just over the next year or two, it was just a lot of communication about uh, details, you know, and uh, logistics and this kind of thing. Um, but it, it, you know, it's. Uh, it's a, it's quite a piece of music, right? It's like yeah. 28 minutes long, In six, five mo mo six, six movements. movements. And uh, the funny thing is that it was originally supposed to be like an eight minute, you know, one movement piece or something. <laughs> but he really took it seriously, yeah. really took it to heart. It He told us that it really meant a lot to him because, you know, he was putting notes down on the page. He doesn't traditionally do that he usually writes charts out and he plays with amazing musicians who just they all bring it alive together but this was something i think you know this is going to be for posterity and he he really cared you know about putting it down just right for himself and so uh yeah he he devoted like a month of his life basically to this um uh, this piece mm. and um kind of use it as a testament i think you know um, yeah and so, he worked uh, yeah. after the piece was written. He worked pretty closely with you guys in the yeah. rehearsal process. He was great. Yeah, we uh, we had a, f a few coachings with him, and um, the first coaching was uh, here at USC, where we're talking right now. Can I say that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> fight on. But uh, you know, he was flying into LA on a day off from his tour to coach us, and so we thought, oh man, this is great. What an opportunity. We have to really have our ducks in line here because he's probably only going to have like you know an hour and a half and just going to be in and out and so we were thankful to have any time with him so he came it was great really gracious 
an hour went by, two hours went by, three hours went by, four. And then after a while, we had to switch rooms because there was some event moving in. <laughs> and he was, he said, well, can we move somewhere else on campus? So we, we moved over to the music building and he spent another few hours with this. And I, I'm convinced that he would have gone till four in the morning if, if we would let him. I mean, that's how much he cared about the music. It was really impressive. He yeah. really cares about the art and uh he loved the fact that we cared about it you know and it was it was really something to work with him so we did that a couple other times besides that usc day and um and then he produced the c the recording you're talking about okay so so he was there in the room with you he was there driving the whole thing and um it was not our normal recording process you know uh, where you you know, you might do a few takes and then, you know, you might patch some problematic sections, perhaps. These were all full takes and these are big movements, like seven, eight minutes long and yeah. pretty difficult. And uh, mostly full takes because I think he wanted, I think he was taking more of a jazz approach. You know, you want this really organic, more of a live performance kind of vibe rather than super edited kind of thing which a lot of classical uh, guitarists do and um so you know i I, we haven't heard it you know yeah yeah i'm I'm sure it's going to be a little different than a lot of our recordings but i'm sure it'll be great they got an amazing sound and he knew exactly what he wanted in the studio it was it was incredible really there is something about really just taking big takes yeah right and maybe just cleaning up a couple things here and there right and I think, like I was saying, the, the jazz's aesthetic is that some of those little imperfections... Is what makes it. ...is part of the humanity of the music. You know, it. it he was actually saying that he kind of likes the occasional squeak or whatever, you know, s- string, yeah. string scrape. Uh, he he, he kind of likes it. It just, you know, because it's real. I, I forgot which movement, but one of them is playing with all these sound effects... Oh. Scraping yeah. and scratching talk, the strings. Talk about squeaks, yeah. Yeah, right. Right. And I know, I know for Scott, it's his biggest pet peeve in sound. He can never stand the sound of squeaks from strings. Yeah, I know. Well, that's you know, it's that's the free side, the free jazz side of Pat Metheny. Yeah, and, and I think we all understood what he was getting at. It yeah, was just yeah. a different kind of expression. Is sure. there any word yet on when it's going to release, or is it when Pat wants to? No official word. I've heard hints, rumors that. Yeah. You know, we're getting substantially closer. Like, I hope within a year. That's, oh, okay. That's nothing official at all, but I'm just optimistic yeah. that it's, you know, with within sight. And are you so, guys going to hear it before it's released, or is it just going to be released one day and Good question. Hear it? I have no idea. <laughs> It'll be quite a surprise if you're just driving around and then you start hearing that on the radio. Yeah, it's well, like, a surprise for a few, few different reasons. <laughs> yeah, we're right? playing this on the radio? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's, uh, I, I've heard it in its entirety two or three times, and I've also mm. heard you guys play excerpts of it because it works mm. well. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, it's best as a whole sweep, but right. several of the movements in isolation works well. In a yeah, I think so, too. As well. it's, uh, it's really a phenomenal piece, and yeah. hence the title. It really is a journey. It's, uh, it is, for sure. It's yeah. uh it's a gem of the repertoire. And is it published? The, the no. Do you, do you know if Pat wants to do that? I know or, he wants to yeah. eventually, for sure. Yeah. But uh, first, got to get the recording out, I exactly. guess. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think that's first, yeah. And then if we have any listeners who don't know about Alan Wilcox, mm. Tillman Hopstock is an amazing German guitarist, one of my idols. But he doesn't, mm. he doesn't tour as much in the U.S. And I saw him play at GFA... In Fullerton, I think it was 2013. I had no idea who he was. And I went to oh, his really? concert, yeah. and it just absolutely blew me away. I remember. I was there, too. It was amazing. And concert. that was the concert when he announced that he is Alan Wilcox. But basically, he was releasing these quote-unquote editions um, of this amazing impressionistic music for solo guitar written mm-hmm. by this British composer, Alan Wilcox. And, you know, it's uh, it's amazing repertoire impressionism and it's a tragedy that we don't have any of that repertoire on solo guitar because the guitar can create such mystic and magical uh right. timbres yeah uh and for 
maybe it was obvious from the start for some people, but for years, people weren't sure, was it actually this totally forgotten lost composer, Alan Wilcox, or was it Tillman? It ended up just being Tillman. And <laughs> right. it, was a, it was a good prank. I like those types of pranks. <laughs> you know, I wish more people did those. But I, <laughs> well, it was for a good reason. It was anyway, for a right? good reason. I mean, he had a fake Wikipedia page for Alan yeah. Wilcox, which got <laughs> taken down. But so he, he was doing that for quite a bit. You know, he did the 12... Etudes, preludes, etudes, and preludes. sketches. Yeah. Yeah. Really amazing pieces. And then it's amazing. He keeps writing because he died in 1930 or something. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. but he recently wrote a great piece uh, for the quartet. What's the name of that work again? So Sweet Transcendent. And this is another multi-movement work. Right. Really nice piece. Um, and that's recently re- released on his label. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to also include that on our next cd so uh but yeah that's a really effective substantial piece yeah yeah as i said uh, that style of music works wonderfully on the guitar and i just love wc arrangements for guitar but on solo guitar it always sounds a bit of a struggle just Mm -hmm. because of the complex harmonies and not being written for the guitar but hearing this style of repertoire Mm -hmm. actually written for the guitar it just right it blooms amazingly. It does. It's effective. Although I, I don't think it's super easy. There's, he he oh, really yeah. makes use of yeah. a lot of harmonics, which are, um, some, some are really tricky to pull off. I mean, yeah. We're talking really those highest partials, you know, it's, it's not the typical harmonics always that you use. So yeah, they're, they're a little tricky. <laughs> yeah. But worth it. Is intonation a problem? You know, it was partials. a little. We we did instead of in doing some of the um, the natural harmonics, which would be slightly out of tune with some other parts of a chord. Say, we made those natural with his approval. Yeah. So yeah, that does produce some issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And was he did did he get to produce the Tillman was there. Oh, okay. And he 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 produ- So it's kind of interesting. We've done the Pat Metheny with Pat Metheny producing and the yeah. Wilcox with Tillman. Uh, producing and and uh, yeah, both both of those experiences were pretty exhausting in a good way. Yeah, you know, I mean, because the composer really, boy, they know what they want and they're gonna just squeeze it out of yeah. you. You know, so those were intense uh, sessions. But how? Happy what type with. of time frame were those sessions? Was it over a week or a couple the, days? The uh, the Wilcox sessions. Uh, no, those those were in. I think that was just one day. Oh, okay. Um, one really long day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's five movements, that piece. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think the Matheny was actually three days. Yeah, and just so the, three full days in the studio. Yeah. But that's 28 minutes of music. So that, that you know. Yeah. I mean, you really do need quite a bit of time, you know, to get all that done. Especially if you're, you're doing full takes, <laughs> like I said. It's got to be a tough balance with coffee for, for that, <laughs> you know, to keep yourself awake, but you don't want jittery hands. <laughs> right. Thank you, Matt, for being on the show. Please join me next time for a conversation with tone bass artist Emmanuel Sowich. Going to leave things with the final movement of Alan Wilcox's Sweet Transcendent. This is titled Danza Diabolico, Los Angeles Guitar Quartet Playing. I'm David Steinhardt, and we'll see you next time for the Tone Bass Classical Guitar Podcast. (laughs) 